Thank you very much, Andrew. And I too would like to acknowledge that we're uh, gathering here today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Great Eora Nation and pay tribute to their elders. Well, I was asked to talk about the social changes that went on in Australia in the 60s and 70s around ideas of race, gender and politics, so hence the title of my talk. Um, I was a teenage demonstrator, sex, race and war in the 60s and 70s. There's going to be more about race and war than um, sex, uh, but it's certainly going to be, it's really from about mid-60s to mid-70s. And uh, during the talk I will be showing some photographs from the Sydney Morning Herald, the uh, Daily Telegraph, the Daily Mirror, as it was then, the Australian and ASIO. And uh, that's now my acknowledgements, and I'll point out the ASIO photographs as they come up. Now, as I said, my life really does, uh, well, the life that you're hearing about today really does mirror that amazing decade from about 65 to 75. And these two, two halves, a very conservative first half, the middle 60s into the late 60s, and then the swinging, amazingly radical second half, sort of from Dobell to Christo or um, Nolan to Gilbert and George. It's a, it's a huge shift in the way people were thinking and the way people were acting. And as you can see, and I'm going to do it by way of my life. That might sound very egotistical, but in actual fact, it's, it's an easy way to talk about the 60s and 70s. So there we are. As I say, middle, middle 60s, Abbotsley, North Shore, very monocultural. I was actually 18 before I met and talked to a Catholic. <laughs> That's actually incredibly true. There I am there as, um, now I'm told there's a laser here. There, there I am as head girl with, of course, the amazing Betty Archdale. Um, I was even a cricket tragic. There I am, I ended up, um, there I ended up captain of cricket. Um, my mother voted liberal. We never knew what my father voted because those were the days when they never talked about it. But I knew my mother voted Liberal because she thought Arthur Caldwell was common. Um, I arrived at university in 1966. Here I am, still pretty conservative. You might recognise some of the people there. Oops. Oh dear. There's um, Alan Cameron. And there's uh, uh, Robin Crawford. And uh, it was just a graduation day in 1966. It wasn't my graduation, but that's what you did in those days. I uh, stood for the Students' Council. Look at us there. There's Michael Kirby, uh, Alan Cameron again, Geoffrey Robertson, uh, Nick Greiner is there somewhere. There I, there's, there I am. There's Richard Walsh. It was a very, still very conservative. We were still wearing, you know, pencil uh, sk skirts down to below our knees and sort of jumped the, you know, cardigans. Um, but what radicalised us? In that, the thing that radicalised all of us in those days was the Vietnam War. I, I fell in with a bunch of radical Catholics. Having just met Catholics, I decided to talk to them. Um, and they, there were Catholics around Father Ted Kennedy, who was a radical Catholic chaplain at Sydney University. And I also met people from the Communist Party, although I didn't know it at the time. And they raised the issue of Vietnam. And it was a huge issue. Uh, young men were dying in their hundreds. Uh, when you think about Afghanistan, we get distressed at the number of young men dying there. But in Vietnam, 500 young Australians died and many more were wounded. And this was also a war that many of us decided was a war we shouldn't be in in the first place. 
Um, conscription, we had conscription for Vietnam also. It became a hugely uh, emotional issue. By 1968, I had become very involved with radical politics at Sydney University. I was in a group called Students for a Democratic Society. We were very influenced by radical politics coming out of America. So here you see me in 1968. That's my second arrest. That's um, Chief Superintendent Stackpool, who I had a bit to do with. Um, that's outside a film called Green Berets, starring John Wayne, which uh, glamorised and was supportive of the um, Vietnam War. So we went to demonstrate against it, and we were all arrested before we could even sort of buy our tickets. Um, that's another demonstration, another Vietnam demonstration. That's me. Now, the interesting thing about this film, uh, photograph is that I'd never seen it until about last year, or it might have been the year before, I went to an art exhibition. It was a ph photographic exhibition by the very well-known Aboriginal photographer Mervyn Bishop, and there I saw this photograph. <coughs> it was quite confronting because it was six feet high, and there, there I was with the top of my stockings showing. My mum would have been horrified. Um, six foot high. Um, and I was so thrilled. Uh, I knew Merv Bishop, but I had, and he had no idea that was me, and I, I had no idea he had taken the photograph. Um, <coughs> now, this photograph's even more amazing. This is me speaking at the third moratorium at, uh, on the steps of Town Hall. And we always used to joke to each other and say, Oh, you know, ASIO's up there on the third floor of Woolworths taking photographs of us. And it was a joke, but in actual fact, they were. This is taken from the third floor of Woolworths by ASIO, and this is what I, one of the many photographs I received when I applied for my ASIO file. If any of you think you might have a file, come and see me and I'll tell you how to get it. And the photographs are amazing. But there I am talking. There's uh, Tom Uren. There's, I think that's Ralph Pierce. Ralph's sister's here today. Um, that's the professor from New South Wales, Tony, Tony Blackshield. Um, yeah, so that's one of my ASIO uh, photographs. Um, and that was amazing. The, the, the moratorium, there was uh, 100,000 people at that. At, that's the third moratorium. There were 100,000 people there. Um, By this time, we had escalated our direct action campaigning. Um, it was, as they always said, the Vietnam War was the first war to be fought out on television. Every night, we went home and saw terrible atrocities happening in, in that sort of grainy black and white footage. And it was the, and I still believe that's why the Vietnam War became such an issue uh, in Australia and America. We had sit-ins at, um, uh, we'd, we'd go and occupy the various strategic places. That's a sit-in at the um, uh, American Embassy or the American Consulate. This is one of the reasons I have a lot of trouble getting into America. I always have to go and have an interview and they have to give me a special visa. Um, we even undertook more radical activity than just the sort of passive sitting in. We were very influenced by the yippies in America. Um, the yippies were those mainly white radicals who believed that you could stop the war by ridiculing it. And so we were very involved in sort of guerrilla actions. That's us taking over the stock exchange. Now, you mightn't even recognise the stock exchange, but that's what it used to look like when they had, uh, and they used to chalk in the figures on those boards. And there I am, uh, we were spray painting uh, the words blood money on the, um, on the stock exchange chalkboards. We actually thought we got away with it, but when I read my ASIO file, I discovered that they did know it was us. Why they didn't arrest us, I don't know. We did manage to escape. Um, we 
looking back at that time, we really did believe the revolution was coming. And I suspect this was the same in the art world. world. I think 1968 was the year that everyone felt that there was a new era coming. Uh, certainly at the political level, we felt that nothing would ever be the same again. It was the year of the student revolutions all the way around the world. There were student revolts in Japan, in Peru, and of course in Paris. They, they took over Paris, remember, the Paris Spring. And, ve and very serious uh, actions took place in America and Britain. See, there I am with um, a friend who's still, uh, he's still in the King's Cross branch of the Labor Party, actually. Um, and as observant people sometimes point out, I'm actually wearing the star of the, the NLF. But we used, to, we used to chant as we were marching down the street, one side right, one side wrong, victory to the Viet Cong, because we had got to the stage where we were so uh, absolutely um, isolated from any form of support for what we were doing in Vietnam that we were actually even supporting the other side. It, it's a bit hard to sort of understand that now. There you are, that's, that's the day of the first moratorium and that's us setting off that that's the arch of the, of the Great Hall and we're setting off to um, march down to um, the uh, Department of Labor and National Service. But what I love about this photograph is, apart from my wonderful white boots, they were very, very fashionable at the time, is this guy here is Paddy Dawson who was a great sort of charismatic student leader but that's him bending down picking up his packed lunch from his mum <laughs> who had come to help on the day. Now, Vietnam did have this incredible, it, it, changed, it changed me completely. I think I'd been quite a conservative person until I discovered that my government was lying to me about Vietnam. And then I started thinking about, well, what else had I always believed in that mightn't be true? The, I was very influenced by new left ideology. And you know, I think you can see this happening in the art world too, is that incredible um, switch from old ways of thinking. New left ideology had sort of three key points to it. It was very anti-Stalinist. We were all trots or Maoists. It believed in participatory democracy. We used to elect revolving chairs. Um, there were no formal structures to meetings, which meant they went forever and ever. Uh, and we believed in personal liberation. And this is how women's liberation, black rights and homosexual rights became so important. Uh, it all grew out of the revolutionary way of thinking we had as we involved ourselves in the anti-Vietnam struggle. Um, my main activity after uh, we, Australian troops were... Um, began to be withdrawn from Vietnam was I got very involved in the anti-apartheid movement. I had become convener of the um, Stop the Tours campaign, which was to uh, try to stop uh, South African, or racially selected all white teams coming to play in Australia. Um, we find that hard to believe now, that for 30 years we had accepted um, racially selected teams into Australia and we also racially selected our own teams to go and play in South Africa. For instance, Yvonne Goolagong had to become an honorary white to go and play in South Africa. New Zealanders weren't allowed to send Maoris in their teams and if we had had Aboriginal players in our teams, they certainly wouldn't have been allowed to go and play in a, in a, a team in South Africa. Uh, we uh, that's the, what is now the South African High Commission. Um, it's wonderful going there now. I go there every June for South African Freedom Day and as I walk up that drive and get greeted at the door by at the very large black South African High Commissioner now, a woman, I think this is fantastic, this is wonderful, this is the new South Africa. 
That's us demonstrating against, there I am there with a group of women friends, that's us demonstrating against the South African tennis players. There, there we are again, that's me, that's my little sister. Um, we had endless um, demonstrations and vigils at outside South African Airways because that was the only, we didn't have a South African consulate in Sydney, so we sat outside South African Airways not day in, day out. Um, now this next one, I love this photograph and every time my son objected to me telling him to go and clean up his room, I used to remember this photograph. This is, our, this is my living room, it's disgusting, in 26 Dargan Street, Glebe, and that's the committee to, for the Stop the Tours committee. There I am, and these are all still friends, and uh, you can actually see ashtrays upon old plates of curry, upon stacks of leaflets, it's just disgusting. Uh, but that was how we ran things. We did, certainly didn't have an office or anything and there were no computers, that's, that's how it was run. And now this might seem an odd thing, but while I was organising the Stop the Tours campaign, I got this letter, well I got a letter from Don Bradman and saying, why are you do? Because he was chair of the um, uh, cricket board, and we were trying to stop the Springboks coming, but the real aim was to stop the cricketers coming. And so he wrote to me and said, Miss Bergman, why are you doing this? Um, so I wrote back and said, blah, 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 you know, racially selected teams, sport should be non racial, etc. And then he wrote back to me, and then I wrote back to him, and we conversed, uh, we corresponded for about a year. And this is a lovely letter, because it's not typed as he normally did it. This one's actually written to me, and as you can hear, he's saying, I had been ex hoping to receive a reply to my letter, you sort of, where is it? <laughs> so he was really hanging on to this um, correspondence. And I put quite a bit of effort into explaining what it was all about, because here was a puzzled, older, you know, man who was, was grappling with the issues. And um, we were terribly thrilled at the end of it all when he came out and we expected him to say the cricketers aren't coming because we can't guarantee their safety. But he came out and said the cricketers aren't coming because we're not going to play South Africa while they still have apartheid. He didn't even say while well, they still have racially selected teams. He actually said, while well, they still have the policy of apartheid, we won't play their cricketers. It was a fantastic statement. And uh, John Bradman, his son, once said um, that it was the correspondence that he had with me and another guy called Peter McGregor that helped him make that statement. So whenever I think, you know, what have I done in my life? I think, oh, I helped um, convince Don Bradman to not let the cricketers come. Um, However, that was getting ahead of myself, the, the really big issue in 1971 was the Springbok tour. And might I say, if I had thought that many years later I'd be showing photographs of this, I would have worn better clothes. <laughs> because that's me in the middle being dragged round by a very unflattering white jumper. Um, and that's the, the, very, the first Springbok match in, a, in, a, in Sydney. Uh, four of us managed to get on. There was my little sister and two others, uh, including Ralph Pearce. And um, when we got into the middle of the ground, because I had no idea they would... I was dressed up as a white... I was dressed up as an Africana. That's why I've got a black wig on and wearing bad clothes. I thought that's what Africanas would wear. And, um, but also I had to disguise myself because the police knew what I looked like and they just arrested me every time I sort of uh, set foot outside. Um, but we actually got the police to stand aside because we'd convinced them we were middle-aged Afrikaners. And just after half time, we jumped over the fence and ran on. And I was just amazed to find myself in the middle of the field. And Verity said to me, what do we do now? And I, 
I just said, lie down. So I just lay down. But Verity actually got hold of the ball and kicked it. And the bulletin called it the best kick of the season because it went right up in the air. So, um, and of course, during that campaign too, I might say, I met the um, seven wallabies who refused to play, the South Africans. And they're still my heroes, those seven guys. They gave up what any little boy wants to do most in their life, which is play for Australia. They gave it up and only one of them ever played for Australia again after that because really the rugby union didn't forgive them. There I am being... They didn't give me any option. Um, they let my little sister walk round, but they wouldn't let... Um, I shouldn't say little sister, she's, you know, she's now a professor, but um, they just dragged me like an old sack of potatoes. Um, there I am, I look quite triumphant there in my black wig and bad clothes. Um, I best, better be quick, hadn't I? That's me being arrested in Canberra and I hadn't done anything there. All I'd gone there with my mother my liberal voting mother, and I just sat, stood there with arm in arm and then they arrested me. Um, it totally radicalised my mother. She never voted liberal again. Um, after the spring box, we had Gary Player. That's me being dragged away from a golf match. That's me being arrested by the uh, chief of the special branch, um, Fred Longbottom, looking very resplendent in polka dots. And this, oops. That there is um, Robert Tickner, who became the Federal Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. I love that as me and Robert and Fred Longbottom. I always think that he looks like he's going to the police ball with one on either arm. Oh, that's another... I also got involved with Aboriginal land rights. And this is another ASIO photograph. You can tell ASIO photographs because they have numbers on them. I'm very proud of this one because I'm number one in this one. And there's my friend Helen Randerson, who still works with me. Um, so you can see the ASIO guys were really very active. They were photographing us wherever we went. Uh, then I got involved with the environment movement and the Green Bands. This is a very young Jack Mundy. Uh, this is down at the rocks, trying to stop the demolition of one of the important um, buildings there. And there am I, can I say, in better clothes. <laughs> This was a magnificent pantsuit. This was absolutely 70s. It was yellow, orange and turquoise checks. But I was very involved with the green bands. There, there I am, um, the Centennial Park green band. So ends the uh, exciting life that I led as a uh, teenage demonstrator. But I just add these final two because this is the circle of life, the sort of kuna matata of the circle of life. That's me being elected as president of the Legislative Council, probably the most sort of dignified position you could possibly be elected to. And I always thought it was so funny where most of the 60s and 70s I'd spent with my the top of my stockings showing and horrifying my mother. Um, and here I was being elected as um, president. However, and I'll finish with my crowning, the most thrilling moment of my life, except for when the Swans won the Cup. Um, and there I am meeting, um, welcoming Nelson Mandela to the Sydney Peace Prize Institute. So um, that's my story of the 60s and 70s. And can I say, when I meet other baby boomers, so many of them had very much the same, the same experience of going from this incredibly conservative 1960s, early 1960s way of life into this amazingly radicalised view where we really believed that anything was possible. We really believed that the revolution was going to happen tomorrow. Um, and in lots of ways it did, certainly in terms of personal liberation for women and for gay activists and for Aboriginal activists. A lot of personal liberation did happen then, uh, although there's still a very long way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you.